very much. Am I going? Are we yeah. doing it? Can you hear me all right? How are you? It's a pleasure to be here with you all, and especially with such fine panelists today. I'm very fortunate to be able to chat with you, and it's going to be a chat, and obviously a chat with you as well. Um, you've already uh, heard who uh, is with us today, and, and it's a fascinating subject, which I think dovetails pretty well with what we were just hearing earlier today, which is media and popular culture. And, uh, you know, it's very clear to many of us that uh, news for many in our country and really throughout the world, news is not uh, as important as uh, a reference uh, for people as entertainment. And, uh, and the entertainment world certainly has a far wider impact on especially the young uh, than news. And I think that's, that's been evolving. The balance maybe has been going more heavy towards entertainment uh, with every year that passes. And so you guys are guilty of this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. And, and I want to start with you, Thomas, because, you know, 15,000 books beats hip-hop, uh, one of your, your books. And, you know, tell us your, your uh, uh, general concept sure. of how things have been changing and how, indeed, um, you know, media has been more balanced towards entertainment than any other time in, in, in our history. Sure. Well, over the past four decades or so, um, uh, the, the trend has been such that black culture, I'm writing primarily about black culture, but there's some overlap with Latino culture as well, but black culture has increasingly become, um, in the popular imagination, in the media, uh, conflated with black street culture, which is one aspect of, of a much larger whole. And so um, the, the, uh, the result has been that there's, I think, very harmful, um, insidious uh, effect has resulted that one's proximity to the street um, is often uh, equated with one's black authenticity, racial identity, so that the further one deviates from the street, from the ghetto, which is to say from harsh circumstances, the further one is actually deviating from one's uh, racial authenticity. And this ha has had profound uh, consequences for the way that we um, define ourselves and define others. Is that new, though? Uh, it is new. My father um, uh, has a very typical black experience that, is, that, is, um, that would be uh, a, a pre-hip-hop era experience. He was born in the 1930s in Texas in the segregated South. Um, he had to overcome some serious uh, structural and institutional um, barriers. But one thing he didn't have to overcome that my friends and I did was this romanticization of, of thug culture, of criminal culture. Um, there was nothing in his life that told him that he was fully realizing himself as a black man by uh, mimicking the behaviors, speech patterns, um, styles of dress that um, that, a, that a gangster true, but but would exhibit. But you know, I, I wasn't there, but I can imagine uh, if you were of the generation that listened to Pat Boone and then Elvis came, all of a sudden Elvis was the devil, and you know his hips would make you wild with sexual urge, and that's what you didn't want for your children. And then all of a sudden the Beatles come out and they have this weird long hair. And they're going to poison our society because they make that safe. Is that not part of just natural evolution with the added uh, uh, adobo or sprinkling of technology? I would just make one um, distinction because I think that um, in the hip hop era something really unique has happened. I, we're really not talking about a genre of music. Uh, we're talking about something that has uh, crossed the boundary and it's almost a secular religion. So hip hop never, I'm not talking about lyrics or songs or, or, or dances. I'm talking about everything from the way you, you shake a hand to the way you conceive of yourself um, is affected by this culture that has, that has permeated the, 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 the fabric of black America in a way that uh, another form of music uh, really can't um, equate. Uh, do you want to chime in on your concept of that? Well. I'm not sure, except that I do think it, you know, uh, in watching the events in Tahrir Square, uh, it was interesting to me that the young Egyptian males were um, speaking in hip-hop rhythms. 
And so it, elsewhere in the world, it becomes a real tool of revolution, but not what here. What does? What becomes a tool of revolution? Uh, hip hop. It, it became a real tool of communication and revolution. But here, I'm not so sure that's what it does. But I don't know enough to say. Let, let me, let me, I'm going to say something else, which is I sort of forewarned it in my, my question in, in terms of asking about really social class when Charlie said the difference is 12 to 1 and even what you just mentioned about your father's journey from Texas. <clears throat> and I just finished reading that extraordinary book. Oh, I just finished The Warmth of Other Suns to have a sense of the types of structural things that the previous generation did to get out of the South. And uh, really, the author argues it's another kind of immigration within this culture. So I'm thinking about culture as a person who spent her life doing culture. Uh, and creating images and questioning uh, racial images and uh, putting myself in the shoes of other races uh, really to try to suggest another way of living than in tribes. And I'm thinking about um, that study that was done that really was a part of the argument that allowed uh, Brown versus uh, Board of Ed to be successful, which was the doll study about, you know, black children seeing the white doll and they you know, fell to pieces, couldn't even finish the, the, the uh, experiment and left. And, and, and how that whole idea in the late 40s of how we needed a better self-image or pride was the last uh, panel talked about in order to succeed. But when they did a new version of that experiment, yes, black children picked the black doll. But part of the way they wanted to set up this revision of the experiment a couple of years ago was to go to a, a certain number of black poor schools, a certain number of white poor schools, a certain number of schools where blacks had wealth, and a certain number of schools where whites had wealth. They couldn't find significant schools with blacks having wealth. And so I think this question that all of us have whenever we have any conversation about race, about social class, is extremely important. And when you talk about the structural things that your father had to overcome, then I think back to something Victor sort of insinuated in the last panel. I kind of think we have to put the self-perception thing on the side. And one of the wonderful things about uh, the studies that Victor also alluded to, uh, uh, Claude Steele's book, uh, Whistling Vivaldi, we see that we all have in us stereotypes about ourselves and other people. And I think about them it, almost in a phrase that Cornel West used for me in a, uh, something that I used to perform him. The ghosts of white supremacy are always there. I am a university professor at New York University. I held an endowed chair at Stanford University for 10 years. The ghosts of white supremacy still occupy me. And they reveal themselves often enough sometimes when I have to have a meeting. How? With a white man or a, a, a white woman. How? They are there. I, I feel that I'm haunted by the ghost of white supremacy. That's the, the, I am haunted by the ghost of white supremacy. So I could spend the rest of my life running from that ghost, or I could find ways to deal with the ghost. And I'm talking about, more importantly, how will I help the young black men and brown men in particular who are on that school to prison pipeline, are there any things I can give them strategies to face off the ghost of white supremacy? And they may not find it on TV. I'm not sure that Mrs. Acolytus or Nancy McNally can help them with that. I don't know that it matters that I play strong women. I really don't know if that helps. But it's almost like a disease that we all bear. And people who have diabetes know they have to watch their diet, exercise, and take insulin. And so it could be that our path, this couple of decades, three or four decades, whatever it is, since 1948, that doll test, we need to move it in the opposite direction. The last thing I want to say, a different direction, the last thing I want to say about it is we're talking about Dennis, um, uh, uh, the insurance man. You know, I remember watching on black and white TV a group of General Electric's executives having several meetings to decide whether Bill Cosby or Dick Van Dyke was going to be their spokesperson. And, and they picked Bill Cosby. And this was way, this was like, you know, a long time ago. And so there's also something going on about why audiences love certain things and certain people that's beyond our means to interpret. We don't know what charisma is. We don't know what presence is. 
And so I think we have to see the limitations of uh, images on television to change a very serious problem because I feel that we're in a moral crisis right now in terms of the number of people that we're throwing in the trash in this country. So, Brian, do you, she says she's not sure that playing a certain role uh, and having, you know, wide diffusion of that role has an impact. What do you think? Well, uh, I think as an Asian American, um, the, what, what I feel informed to speak about is uh, how, how we're perceived in, through roles on television, through media. And it's interesting listening to the previous panels and seeing the, st the statistics. Asian Americans, you know, obviously we have a good stereotype of being the model minority, and, and yet when it comes to specifically being in, in the public eye on television, in an athletic arena, for instance, we often have the short and the stick. So I think it is, I think it, I've heard through a lot of feedback that uh, the roles we choose and portray actually does have an influence. It has a, you know, it does, it does speak to the, the younger generation. And so what I find really interesting, you know, and there's different mediums to that. There's, there's certainly film and television, and then there's the internet these days. And the internet, and I think this all ties together with some of the Pew research, tells you that, you know, I didn't actually didn't hear what Asian Americans households were in terms of like how wired and their broadband levels are. But if you look at today's, I don't know how many people know this, but some of the top subscribed YouTube personalities that are acting out sketch comedy, doing makeup tutorials, uh, putting on whatever variety of different um, entertainment properties that are out there, I'd say five out of the top ten are Asian Americans. and. And that's really important, I think, you know, in terms of the second panel we had today, in terms of informing our youth uh, through these characters and stories that they tell, you know, how we, how we get educated, how we, you know, build up our confidence and self-esteem, because media is so important in terms of how you tell your story or, or, or give your voice to America in terms of who you are. So uh, I think just from my standpoint, uh, it, it is important to answer your question, and, and I think uh, I think the internet in particular right now is is that one that one platform that's kind of evening the playing field, so to speak. Because for us as Asian Americans, traditionally, you know, having to live up or having those stereotypes of certain roles and whatnot, it's being chipped away at now, and 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 so that's that, that's my thought, thoughts on that. And and Thomas, I, I, interesting because I've been very concerned uh, in my line of work with the digital divide that exists, uh, especially in the Latino community. Uh, a Latino community that oversamples on the use of smartphones, but has less access to the internet at home. And so programs like Comcast's uh, Internet Essentials, which is a whole Spanish language aspect called Internet Basico, which I'm privileged to be able to be a part of, uh, addresses that. But the fact of the matter is that putting aside the aspect of the internet, which is really important, especially to young people. There really is a, um, a cultural definition by many. They define their own culture by what they see in people who really don't have much in common with them, but that share a certain uh, hip hop, for example. They share those things which we can see in Egypt, but here in the United States, and, and this is something I want to ask Thomas, which is your point. There are differences between how the people in Egypt use hip hop culture and how it's used here. Absolutely. And I, I want to get into that, but if I may just sure. uh, touch on one thing that you mentioned. Uh, this, 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 uh, you said putting cultural explanations to the side while there are structural and inst institutional uh, problems. Just to the side. We can't ignore it, but we've been focused on that for we several decades. I think that there's, there's often this kind of opposition between the two things. Um, and, and, and in a lot of social science and policy circles, um, there's a kind of dogmatic aversion to talking about cultural factors. It's, 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 it's not allowed, it's not polite to talk about um, cultural factors while there are these very serious um, structural problems such as joblessness, poor schools, um, overrepresentation in prison populations. However, I take the opposite view, and I think that it necessitates a, a, a discussion of culture if these structural factors are um, existent, because a negative culture exerts a disp disproportionate influence on uh, members of groups that are more fragile than others. So 
you know, if, 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 if it's the fact that 50% uh, of black kids don't graduate high school, then a negative culture that emphasizes an anti-intellectual and, uh, and a pro, uh, or criminal um, friendly um, view of identity, that disproportionately is gonna harm a kid who's on the edge and it's in a way that it will not harm an upper middle class white kid who likes to listen to hip hop and engage in that culture. And it might not even apply to the kid in Terror Square, Square who has a very different reference point. So I think that, you know, uh, that's why I'm not talking about hip hop as a music or as an art form, but I'm talking about it as a conduit um, for transferring uh, a certain value systems. Well, you call it a secular religion. It is, uh, yeah. In, in many ways, it functions as such here. And in, in France, where I live, it functions slightly differently, although there are some similarities. It, it serves as a, as, a, as a way for um, Arabs and, and African blacks to, to voice their um, sense of marginalization. But in, in America, it's come to, to, to really, um, because African Americans and Latinos are so, um, such a part, they're, they're, the, they're the owners of this culture that has come to be a source, not just a vehicle or a tool, but it's come to be a source of, of, of self-definition. Well, let me concede, because I don't think we should get you and I in, 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 in a binary either. Let me make it clear that I feel it goes hand in hand, but we cannot expect culture to deliver changes in society. I think the young woman from Howard, if, if she's still here, said it so well, the editor of the paper, when she said that um, in response to the question I asked about what are the aspirations, you know, even there, you know, she said very quickly that, um, you know, uh, lots of, of young people at Howard want to make more money, even that. They have that aspiration, but it's not necessarily going to de deliver the kind of social change that we're talking about here. That's what right. she said. So I think it's, it's uh, certainly many things coming many things coming together. Let me say one quick thing about the early, old days of, of hip hop. So, so I did a- Which would a, be what years? Well, uh, like when I was in the streets in 92, 93, after the Los Angeles riots, and I traveled around, I made a play and named it after a gang member and so forth. And what I noticed was there wasn't an anthem. Like the young men I talked to said it was a revolution. I would start every interview by saying, first of all, what did you think this was? A riot, a revolution, social exposure? Revolution. So, but I thought it was interesting, you know, the civil rights movement had all this music. I hope that, you know, we have the, the main scholar of that here, Taylor Branch. And, I, and so I, I said, you know, what, what, what were people singing? They weren't singing. They were playing Fuck the Police. That was their anthem. They were blaring it on the windows. And a great civil rights activist, who is the man who was the, uh, brought not, was with non Lawson? Jim Lawson. Jim Lawson. I asked him later, I said, you know, the civil rights movement had all this music. Oh, yes, he said. I said, blah, 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 these kids, and blah, blah, rap, you know, fuck the police. I said, why weren't they singing? Why weren't they singing? And he said, because music is, notice, he said, it is aspirational. Singing is aspirational. And what worries me about this, without being a hip-hop scholar like you, is, is this music actually without aspiration? Then, then it's doing a terrible thing because it's facilitating despair. That's an interesting point. I think it is not without aspiration. I think hip hop uh, is one of the most aspirational uh, cultures. It's a different type of aspiration, though, because uh, it's an aspi aspiration to, to um, I think, a very cynically materialistic yeah. view of human life and, and, and human possibility. Uh, and, and so the, the aspiration is very different than the, than the, the, the songs of Marvin Gaye. And the aspiration is for the person singing it. In other words, exactly. it's just about me. Me. It's me, not me. about you. It's right. about us. It's not me. How about us? Yeah, I mean, that's already even more uh, a stretch. But, but just the, the possibility of inclusion doesn't exist. Uh, and it's about, uh, and I'm not you know, an expert on it either, but from what I've heard, there is no us. It's very interesting. A lot different than what's going on, huh? It's a lot different than what's going on. Do you think that, and, and there's so many things that we're touching upon, and, and bringing it back to you, for example, you, you've had role models growing up. Uh, you're a young guy. How old are you? If I could ask. Not that young. Okay. <laughs> Don't make him say he's an actor. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask him about the house. So. Okay. I just wanna... <laughs> you're, you're it's not a question that goes around or anything. Um, um, Growing up, you had role models. Who were they? 
and why were they role models to you? Well, that's an interesting question. I, my role models, I, they were all over the board. Um, I think uh, from an acting perspective, I actually really looked up to um, Sandra Oh, who probably is not even that much older than me, but she's, she was a kind of a, you know, I always saw her and B.D. Wong uh, for, uh, specifically as, as two character actors who I thought, you know, wow, these, these two are really, you know, taking on roles that are kind of going against the grain. They, uh, they were working, steadily working, and as an actor, that's one of the most important things is getting jobs. <laughs> uh, so I really thought those two in particular. Uh, but what, what, what was it about them that made you look up to them? Because they had a steady job? Was it, was it the roles they took? Was it the attitudes they espoused? Was it the... You know, what was it? It was, it was all of that. I mean, it goes back to the first question of, like, does what you do, do the roles you take, do they have an effect on a young mind? And, and, and I think for me it was. I saw B.D. Wong played, you know, he was M. Butterfly. He was in uh, the movie with Steve Martin, I forget right now. But, uh, and Sandra Oh, similarly, as, you know, on Broadway, off Broadway, on, on the silver screen, doing all kinds of all-American roles, so to speak. And, you know, it's really inspiring for me because I always made a conscious, you know, I told myself as I was studying theater at Cal, I was like, if my role consists of doing, you know, the, the immigrant to the Chinese delivery boy, which was actually my first job in General Hospital, uh, to <laughs> at being asked to do mar martial arts all the time, I'm probably better off going to be, a, you know, an engineer or a doctor. And so, uh, so I really looked up to those those you know, people as, as role models to help me make an informed decision that, you know, if I want to go all the way in this, this field, that's exactly what I want to do. So, so for me, it absolutely resonated. And, and I think it's, in terms of paying it forward now, it's important whether you're doing, you know, roles on TV or on the internet or whatever medium, you know, music, that there are people out there, there are young minds that are always absorbing what you do. And, and this is interesting, and I want your thoughts on this, is that Brian, because he knew what he wanted, aspiration, dreams, he looked for someone in that field that he could latch onto in certain ways. But if you don't have that American dream, that aspirational thought, if you don't know, or you think that there is no possibility you can progress, because of your surroundings and what you've known all your life, then it's easier to latch on to people who don't have positive stories, but rather are talking about money and guns and women and Respect. meaningless, uh, meaningless uh, uh, philosophical or spiritual uh, things. Well, I think for Brian, the journey is very different and, and very interesting and unique because not only do you, to me, that, that journey is in part about um, the uh, gratitude for something being visible, right? Because Asian Americans were even less visible and, and the model minority, but also the sort of invisible minority in this way of, of being considered, you know, it, it gives us lots of things right. to think about. It's Stanford where I taught you know, yeah. you could hardly call Asian Americans a minority, and the white students were extraordinarily jealous of how well they did in school, right? So you probably would maybe like to play a thug, right? Because, Absolutely, right, yeah. the stereotype <laughs> is that you'd never be a thug, right? So for you, you're living in the world of imagination. You, you would like to play a murderer because you're an actor and that, that's what you do, right? Um, I think that, that there is something... Scientist thug. A scientist thug. Um, and I want you to be able to, to use your gift, right? That's a gift you have. So that would be kind of like if you were a cellist, you weren't able to play a cello because Asians could only play the drums. I mean, so this is good for you. But I'm thinking about how I watch taxi TV. That's really about the only TV I watch in New York. And Telemundo. Uh, <laughs> well, the, Telemundo is another matter, which I want to ask you about. Let's go for it. But, 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 so I watch Taxi TV, and, you know, they play the same thing over and over again, right? So, and I get obsessed with one or two of them and hope they'll play, like Jimmy Kittle, Kimmel did something with models that was hilarious, the food they eat, whatever. But there was, there was, there was, that, now on Taxi TV, it's the Ke Kelly and Michael show. 
You, you want to have the Kelly and Michael oh, show here? So it's Kelly Ripa, who's this tiny oh, blonde yes, yes, yes. and a black football, former football player. Huge guy. And it was Regis and Kathy Lee or whatever. Well, all, how it all became, Regis and Kelly. So the last one I saw before I left New York was the football player. Now, this is against the background of me finishing uh, The Warmth of Other Suns and, you know, stories like about Emmett Till and things like that. Here's the football player on a, doing a bench press. Big black guy. He's like seven doing, feet or something. Seven feet yeah, and huge. huge, doing a bench press with this tiny blonde going up and down like that. And I thought, whoa, whoa. In 1983 or five, I was at a, a dinner, a Thanksgiving Day dinner, Thanksgiving, day before Thanksgiving, with uh, uh, Lenny Kravitz and the woman he was married to at the time from the Cosby Show. And I'm dropping names, I know. Right. It was only because my friend Diane Sounds took me. Very, very uh, uh, Whoops, pick, 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 pick them up. And, and Barbara Bain from Mission Impossible was at that dinner. And I was just arrived in LA trying to make my mark, it didn't work. And teaching at USC. Uh, and, and Barbara Bain told me that in Mission Impossible, they would not allow her and Greg Morris to be in the same frame. In the same frame. And I actually thought about that when Obama and uh, then Senator Clinton were <coughs> debating each other. I thought, this is a black man and a white woman in the same frame. And now we've got this football player pushing yeah her up and down. So does that mean we're better off or does that mean that we have shifted our realm of desire? Have we shifted what we desire, what can be desired, okay. and have we shifted what we're terrified of? And how does desire and fear, you know, that's where culture lives. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm, again, very interested in, in, in these, th this gap between, between rich and poor and how that the structure of desire and fear does or doesn't uh, play into that. Because Trayvon Martin, right, everybody wears a hoodie, but he was killed for it. Well, to answer, I mean, are we better? I think we are better off. I think that um, racism, you know, it functions as a box. And I think that uh, there are a lot of black people still trapped, trapped inside of this box. but. Um, there are more black people than ever who are, who are moving outside of the box and are free to do that. I think, you know, we talked about imagery. I think that there's a lot of power in an image, symbolic power, and I think that uh, obviously Barack Obama, um, the image of, the, of him and his family has done a lot to, 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 to make, to, to make the, the country different very fast. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure that uh, a black man, a big muscular black man bench pressing a petite blonde white woman is doing much to advance our ideas, our received ideas and stereotypes of, of what. Um, well, but, but what she was saying, I mean, what's acceptable or considered yeah, acceptable. Yeah. Is, what can be joyous sure, sure. I mean, rather than. But, but hey, listen, sure forget, you know, I love Lucy, you know, a Latino with a, with a redhead. That was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it was brilliant. And it was brilliant. Uh, probably. Uh, revolutionary because it was so brilliant uh, but but things really have changed now the question is now that this door has been opened maybe not all the way what are we going to do with it what do you do what with are it? we doing with it and what we're doing is not necessarily a positive step forward so I have a question okay. for you about Telemundo Go. all right so so I had a little revolution in my own mind because normally yeah. Okay. So uh, normally, you know, in a panel like this, I would think that we would all, if, if we were all actors, yes, we would be grieving the lack of roles, right? We'd be grieving that, and we and the grieving, like, why aren't there more fabulous sitcoms with Latino people on television? Which you know, we we, we might say. How about one. <laughs> okay, but which television? Because what it dawned on me, I mean, Spanish-speaking people have the opportunity to see lots of stuff in a whole other world on television, which is Spanish-speaking television. Yes, and, and not and all... We are the ones who miss out. And not all, of it is, not all of it is positive either. Uh, and, and the fact is that there's some things which you know, should change. But I've got to tell you something. 
What I find fascinating, to answer your question, and I love your thoughts on it, is how I see, because I am able to speak English with not a lot of accent, y, y el español lo puedo hablar bastante bien, um, how in many ways they're two different universes. Forget two worlds, there's two universes. And, and, um, and so the role models that exist in Spanish language are honestly different. We, we, and I'm generalizing, but I see, for example, that the role, I, I as a television news person, get much more out of a relationship with the viewer than I think the average English language television personality gets from theirs. Uh, you know, here's a guy we admire very much, Juan Williams. You know, a, a guy who has, for me, uh, just uh, followed his career and find him to be courageous. Um, he gets blasted, he gets disagreed at, he, but he's seen as by a certain slice of American culture. Spanish language television uh, has a different relationship with people and it's 50.5 million uh, strong in this country and every month 50,000 Latino, U.S. born Latinos turn 18 years of age every single month in the United States of America. And so what's interesting to me is how different their perceptions are of who their role models are. Yes, Latinos look up to uh, celebrities as much as the general market. And they certainly live their fantasies through who's sleeping with who and who is divorcing who, just like every mainstream. But they also depend much more on news and information. And the way I describe it to myself as I'm trying to describe it, is the Latino population sure sees television for the same reason many people see it. To be entertained, to watch Hawaii Cinco Cero, uh, to, uh, you know, disconnect, listen to music, etc. But then for a large population in this country, a big chunk, that television set is also a safe in a world of fear. Ah. A safe view to their past, it's a window to their present, and it's a visa to their future. Because that television screen in their home will not come and deport them, yeah. will not separate their families. Right. I just got an email this morning as I was coming here from a lady in South Carolina who said that ICE came into her community yesterday and took away a number of men. Uh, that happened last night. Uh, 1,400 deportations are occurring today. 1,400 occurred yesterday, 1,400 will occur tomorrow and every single day uh, unless there is some comprehensive <coughs> immigration reform. And so that television screen, even if you're a citizen or a resident and don't have that fear, but there for, for the grace of God go I or with my cousin or with my partner or with my uh, gardener or with the person who gives me deliveries. So you know and cherish someone who lives in that fear. And that television screen is an extraordinarily safe place to see the place you left behind, to see what's out there, and to see how the future is going to be. And so that gives people like me a privilege. Real privilege. Because I am seen in a world where not just who you're sleeping with, divorcing, how many guns you have, cars you have, or gold teeth you have. That is important, but also you're informing them. Well, the other thing that... Uh, Does that make any sense? Yes, and when I thought about Spanish television, the other th I asked George Lakoff, the linguist at um, uh, Berkeley, who uh, uh, we all looked to, uh, the Democrats looked to, to try to explain what happened when, what happened in when, the when, go of when, when Gore lost. Oh, when Gore, Gore lost. Uh, and he wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant. And uh, so I asked him what keeps a language alive. Interestingly enough, earlier that week, as a sidelight, I'd asked a woman linguist what keeps a language alive, and she said, languages stay alive in the kitchen. Languages stay alive because you speak them. And I asked Lakoff what keeps a language alive, and he said, ships and guns help. <laughs> and even though we think about uh, Latino Americans as a minority, e e even with numbers, we still think that, yeah. the fact is, you had ships and guns in, in your, in, in, on your, your side. You have a language that is alive and well, 
And that is a power. That is a power. It's being lost. It's but being lost. It's, but but it, it's not, not on Telemundo. No, but, but I think that in Spanish language television, uh, a lot of the viewers are those that don't speak English, right? But their kids watch. You know, I can't tell you, you're talking about age, I can't tell you how many times a week I get, my mother loves you. My grandmother thinks you're great. <laughs> By like people my age. Uh, and, and that is because you grow up in a place where in your living room, your parents choose the station. And then you see old guys like me, and then maybe I'm on MSNBC, and you go, gosh, that guy speaks two languages. That's kind of weird. Uh, but your parents determine the language at home. I, for example, was born in the United States and raised here. And I've never, this is a secret just between us, I've never taken a Spanish language course. But you can speak. I speak it every day. It's my language of preference. You speak French, but do you speak Swahili or anything else no, like that? No, I'm not even very proud of the way I speak French. <laughs> do you speak something, Brian? I speak Mandarin. See, that's useful. It's well, but, and, and, and you, talk about usefulness, you actually spent time in China. And you have uh, seen, and it's interesting how, for example, uh, you know, Hollywood goes to China and gets movies done there and, and, you know, brings in everything. But you don't often see the opposite. No. Um, so, as we all know, right. chi China has become, you know, such an international uh, power. It, it follows, you know, reasonably stands that Hollywood's going to go there for, for the opportunity because there's 1.3 billion people to put their product in front of. So, uh, I, in the last five years of, as a Chinese American, having Mandarin abilities, gone over How there. How good is your Mandarin, by the way? Uh, hi, hi. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I, I can't read or write, which makes me technically illiterate, but I speak it fairly <laughs> proficiently. I always say that. And you got that through the home? I got it through the home. I did go to Chinese school, but I, it was always Saturday morning and against yeah. cartoon time, so I didn't really pay attention. <laughs> so it was really through the parents and, and grandparents. But um, So going to China and working between the, the two cultures has been really interesting. Um, you know, Hollywood is king, and any product you put out of there globally is accepted. But as you said the other way around, it, it's not comparing apples to apples. You, you know, China is trying to take their films and put it, stories and everything and putting them out in Hollywood, and they're just being, you know, met with crickets. But you know, it would be fabulous as if they just were kind of like, you know, you know, no deal. We're, we're not going to sell here. We're not going to sell in China. If we, I mean, that would be real cultural power. We don't know it that kind of thing is going to happen. Well, what, to do what? To say, we're not going to promote your, we're not going to sell your movie in China if we can't, you know, you won't promote ours here. Right, right. Well, uh, unfortunately, there's a problem of piracy then in yeah, China, which yeah. is a whole other panel. But, you know, <laughs> people there know everything before even people here know about it because of the 50 cent DVD on the corner. So. Uh, so it's always going to, you know, this is a, and it's not just about China. This is a true story. A friend of mine, <laughs> shit, it's not funny. A friend of mine <laughs> is a producer in Australia. He, uh, uh, he's Greek, uh, Australian, and he put all of his money into making a movie called. It's about uh, one of the Greek islands, and he said this is really great because I put all my. It's a true story. Two summers ago, I put all my money in this movie. It's going to be coming out soon, and I make it. It's going to be great. We were on the beach in a Greek isle. Were you in it, the movie? No. Oh. Uh, he's telling me about this. Okay. And here comes a guy passing with fake DVDs, and his movie was on it. No. <laughs> so he saw his movie, which wasn't released, you know, to the, it was been released in Australia, about the Greek isles being sold on the Greek isles. <laughs> That's piracy, you know, <laughs> at the speed of light. Right. And, and when you have that, it's really tough. To, uh, to kind of control uh, your product. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no, um, well, getting back a pretty to interesting a, anecdote, a, but maybe I'm the only one. A couple no, things. No, people, people did laugh. Did they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this relates back to something we were talking about earlier uh, in terms of, you know, it's interesting, the, the concept of, I forget what you called it, the ghost of white. Still haunted supremacy. by the ghost of white supremacy. Yeah. Quoting and, Professor Cornell West. Okay. Uh, I, uh, growing up, you know, as a young mind, I, I, I went through this similar struggle, in, specifically in the realm of entertainment, because Hollywood is controlled by, you know, such figures. And so 
one of the things I've chosen to do is to actually uh, not a lot, you know, it's funny, I wear different hats on different days and I actually uh, started producing because in order to, I feel like, tell better stories about my community, I felt like, well, who else is going to do this for us but us, right? So, so Asian Americans, there's always, a, we always, you know, talk about a lack of representation on screen. So if no one's going to do it, then, then if I put on a producer hat and build a team around me, then, you know, that's how we're going to get things done, DIY, right? So, so that's, that, and, and I, I find it, you know, it, it's, it's a constant struggle, um, but rather than sit there and think about, you know, the, the, the ghosts, you know, in order to affect change, you really have to just kind of take it into your own hands and, and you know, put, put your work out there and hopefully it sticks and continues to be. And I think it's important to point out um, that even though we have, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but Kelly and Michael, right, mm -hmm. uh, there's almost no power of color in culture. Or uh, color or Latinos. No, of color, of color, of all colors. I mean, there are very few studio executives who are other than white, uh, you'll be on a given television show, and maybe in five seasons there'll be one woman director. Uh, crews are almost entirely white, and so there's a lot that goes on where decisions are made in cultural enterprises where I venture to say that corporate America may have more success in their diversity uh, Campaigns. They and may have had more success than we have. The theater is a disaster. Well, and, and there's a lot of there are a lot of disasters to talk about. Uh, and and you know you look at television. I mean, look at television. And look at look at the people that are on television. Look at the people that are putting television show together. Look at the people who decide who goes on. It's television the decision show. makers who yeah. concern. But that's all the why way, Brian's project of right. producing is so important. But there has to be a possibility for people to see that in order for it to be successful. By the way, if you want to ask questions or chat, go ahead and, and, and come up to the... Uh... May I just add? Yes, Eric, please do. I, I would say that all of those are important factors, but that uh, you can never um, leave out of the conversation audiences. Audiences Correct. matter, and their choices matter. And I think that um, more and more if now. you want to see change, it, it, producing your own uh, work is, is the best thing you can do. But if you want to really see change, then, um, then audience have to demand that things change and, and corporations are profit driven, they'll, they'll serve that. And I'm, I'm skeptical that, uh, in terms of the black community, I'm skeptical that there has been enough outcry and demand for, for, for better representations thus yeah, far. I, I, I'm not sure that, I mean, I agree with you, but I'm not sure that oftentimes corporate really listens to what people ask for because I have been in many meetings when they've said, oh gosh, when X Latino was on X network, our numbers went up. Next page, no more <laughs> Latinos. So, yeah, 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 the numbers go up and, and they like it and they applaud it and they'll buy you a, you know, a cake, but that's it. Or, or what you happens put more on and that's what, not happening. What happens when there's critical dissent from the public, let's say with the health, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with Spike Lee and other people saying about Viola Davis's character and the portrayal. We don't want to see that type of thing anymore. I mean, how do you feel that, do you feel that makes a difference? Um, Spike Lee, uh, uh, Spike, Spike Lee is directing not representative the, uh, Mike Tyson. Uh, that's the same Spike Lee, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the thing I think is that Spike Lee is not representative of, of, the, of the black audience, though. So. Um, I think he tried to. He tries to. He be, tried right. to inflame tries to the black audience. But what I mean is, if you look at where the black audience is, they, look at the numbers that Tyler Perry does, and, and that's right. that's black owned and produced. And and you know, there's a lot of black people um, who would have a problem with the representations he puts out, but the audiences vote with their dollars and their time, and support it. He's a billionaire. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. I, I just add to that. Um, in thinking about you know things like Telemundo and BET. In the Asian American space, there's like there's a void of that. Be right. There have been some failed attempts in the last decade or so uh, for cable network Asian American focused fare, uh, Asian slash Asian American focus, I should say, in language and in English, and they've failed miserably. Um, you know, I think some corporate sponsors are mindful of it, but like you said, a lot of times it's to kind of meet a quota. That's right. And in they're the mindful end, of it, and they'll remind you of it <laughs> for a thousand years. Uh, even though it may be a fluke because it was maybe something that wasn't great. I don't know. I have a question. Yeah, I want to talk about culture as commodity. 
Yes. And whether um, selling and marketing comes with a price. And I would like to maybe to talk specifically about the NBA and its marketing in terms of use of hip hop. The NBA. The NBA. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, a huge price has been paid um, for black America in that um, all of the representations of black success, or a, a disproportionate um, amount of the rep representations of black success have been um, athletes or rappers and, uh, or, or entertainers of uh, some other sort. But the reason why I say hip hop is such a problem is not because of the music, but because even the athletes, those, that's hip hop as well. So you can just say LeBron James or Allen Iverson, they play basketball, but all of their cultural references actually point towards hip hop, which points towards the street. So it's all part of the same um, culture as commodity uh, machine that sells not just to blacks, but sells to whites and to international markets this very narrow and limited um, idea of what it means to be black. Um, so when I'm in Europe or I'm in Latin America, I have to deal with the fact that um, there are already um, uh, ideas of what being black means in people's head that uh, uh, before I can even uh, encounter them. So that means that uh, oftentimes I don't fit in with what is supposed to be black. And so then again, you pay this penalty in authenticity. You somehow deviated from what it is. So I think the NBA, uh, the NFL, all of these things feed the same machine. And so the media has, an, and, and political leaders and thought leaders and intellectuals have kind of an obligation and a burden to, to try to um, present as many alternative narratives as possible. So what would be an alternative narrative? An alternative narrative would be, you know, um, uh, so, uh, a Latino author who has done this for Dominicans would be Juno Diaz. Right. An alternative would be an African American writing a novel that really describes the black experience and its breadth and depth. Like who? Um, exactly. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, maybe that might be that maybe uh, now you're putting quite a bit of pressure on the artist. We would we would yearn for it. We would like it to come forward, but it might not. But we've you know? had that in the past. But certain we've, circumstances, we've lost cer it. Yeah, certain circumstances gave us a James Baldwin. Or and a Ralph Ellison. A Ralph Ellison, Toni Morrison, Antizaki Shange in the moment it, as a playwright, very, very critical. We can't necessarily stimulate that. We can try, but then we get to the thing that you say, the audience is itself capricious. It is. But you might want, you might not like them to like Tyler Perry, but believe me, they do. Right, but the, I think that one of the problems is that not that we do have black novelists still. In the, there's a ten-year-old that could be a, a James Baldwin, but now he's channeled in if he has a verbal ability, uh, likely a channeled there. into expressing that um, through through the medium of hip hop. So we want to disrupt that. So how would I, we disrupt that? We disrupt that. We can start with these these important dialogues, and then I think we disrupt we disrupt that in our own homes, but also you know. We have to. We have to. We we have to push the conversation. She knows. She That's knows. Right. She's very smart. How do we disrupt that? Well, so you know what's interesting, right? When you talk about disruptors, especially when you start talking about the impact that hip hop has on culture, right? You look at T.I., right? Who's I don't know how many people are familiar with T.I., but rappers been to prison, used to sell drugs. Mm -hmm. He's now a multimillionaire, and his show, The Family Hustle, I think it is is probably the closest approximation to the Cosby show that we have right now, right? So you see that con that contrast in you have this hip hop figure who's a family man, he's married, they have a blended household, they have all their kids, he teaches like entrepreneurial type things to, you know, his children. And so like when you start talking about kind of touch points, it's taking something that resonates with people and then translating it into a beneficial outcome. It's not just saying, hey, hip hop is all there is, I'm just gonna stay here, but it's, well, hip hop is how I got my how money. How do you do that? What's the next how do you piece? do that? How do you do that as a society? Well, so it's interesting. I think that, and this actually was my question, so I, I love this. Um, I think there's a role for the artist, right? So when you are in a position of um, affluence, of power, and you have said resources to change the dialogue where you're not beholden to the Hollywood studio, you take a Tyler Perry, I don't endorse his stuff, but take a Tyler Perry who has the money and the means and the resources to change some of the images, that's one access point. When you talk about the audience, it's dialogue like this, but it's also reaching people where they are, right? Folks are here. They're on their mobile devices. Mm -hmm. They're on Twitter. Mm -hmm. There are about 100 people in this room. What about the hundreds of thousands of people who would benefit from this conversation who aren't here? So it's how do we start to take 
these types of movements and make them viral in a way that resonates with people. I loved your point about kind of communicating different universes, right? So you go to mainstream TV, you might not see um, a large presence of Hispanic talent, but you go to Univision, you go to Telemundo, you go to public access channels, and you can find bits and pieces of culture. How do we start empowering well, those Let me ask you, I mean, mediums? you're yeah. a South Florida person. Yes. You know that the, the differences that exist uh, and that you know, I mean, I remember growing up in South Florida and the bumper sticker was, will, will the last American leaving South Florida please bring the flag? <laughs> uh, because the invasion for many in the whites was at first, it's bad enough that the blacks are here and now the Latinos are here. Uh, and so there, the bumper sticker, you remember, was will the last American leaving Miami please bring the flag? And so now maybe the flag is not there. I mean, if you go to Miami, it's a very international city where everybody can feel like they're from there. But how do you translate that and transfer that reality across a country that maybe hasn't gotten that experience yet? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple access points. It's like the lowest hanging fruit is really leveraging the internet, right? Because a lot of people who have access to the internet, whether it's by their phone or by their tablet or whatever, there's a there's a large opportunity there to create new new levels of content, and that's where we're seeing a lot of movement head, right? So that's one place. But when you talk about people in more established media. Right, it's how do you leverage the power you have? It's hard to tell an artist who's excited about, oh, I got a $50,000 deal to say, okay, now you can't peddle smut because if you do, your $50,000 deal is out the door, but it's the people who are established. You know, there's a certain point at which, yes, it's about the individual. Yes, you know, we want people to lift themselves up from their bootstraps, but if you do that, you're gonna fall, right? It's like, try pulling yourself up by yourself. You will fall, you need a hand, and it's You not need a hand, but there are, you know, there are really gatekeepers, and the gatekeepers really are interested in numbers, and that is true. I mean, you can't argue with $2 trillion of buying power. It's like, there's a collective effort that has to occur yeah, at the they, grassroots level. But they, level they intellectually the understand it, but money. they're not living it yet. Yeah. And so and so, yeah, I understand that there's a big buying power, and I know that this is the largest, for example, Latinos are the largest minority. I get that, but how do I deal with that when I'm not from that world? That's the disconnect that I see. We have other questions, and I appreciate yeah, your you. time. Yes, ma'am. What would it take to introduce more positive and diverse images of good students and good educators into popular culture? Somebody who finds something that hits a nerve, that hits a nerve that people love, again, that really manages to hit a nerve of desire and fear. I know that's, and we just don't know when that's gonna happen. You know, you talk about I Love Lucy, she mentioned Bill Cosby. We may or may not like these forms, but it, it, it takes that combination of talent and skill and hitting the zeitgeist. What, what blows my, you mentioned Bill Cosby, what blows my mind is th that's 20. She mentioned Bill or, Cosby. Or we have been, we've been mentioning Bill Cosby. What blows my mind is that it's been 20 years since we've had something like that. We still talk about that as a reference point. Because there is nothing else. Because there's nothing that's come even close and, and, and there's, no, there's nothing, I mean, T.I. is such a, the fact that we've taken such steps, cultural steps backwards from, from, uh, from a great show like that, is troubling to me, and and I don't know that it's. Well, it's not just the show; it's the talent. I get, what, when I mentioned Bill Cosby originally, it was that he was chosen after much much scrutiny to represent General Motors before the sh before show. Before the show, yeah, sure. And well, before that, he was on I Spy, so he was probably one of the first black men, uh, sort of virile black men on television with a, a white co-star. And by the so, way, where is that in the Latino community? Where have you seen that? The only one I'm thinking of is Sofia Vergara, and is that? The I Spy version of it, probably Maybe. not. Maybe. Well, I don't know. No, I would but say we just, no. But that's what I mean is like, why did people love Bill Cosby? We can't put that into words, but that's what has to Funny. happen. Go ahead. I think uh, to answer that question, it really, uh, unfortunately in Hollywood, you know, the things that sell are to quit. what, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I guess. But the people who are gatekeepers, the content creators, associations like, um, I, I actually, I, I'm involved with a movie about the NBA basketball star Jeremy Lin, which I was going to talk about. Go ahead and talk uh, about it now. <laughs> it's a documentary story about Jeremy and his rise from nowhere to the top of the world. And, and if you watch this film, which I hope you guys will at some point when it comes out later this year, um, 
you know, there's a lot of good values in the, his story, family-friendly, Christian-based, uh, and, you know, just very universal themes that I think a lot of youth and educators will, will gravitate towards. It's a lot of the feedback that we got at Sundance and South by Southwest. Um, but specifically, you know, I learned through this process, there are organizations out there that, such as a Christian family faith based, uh, I forget their name, but they promote virtuous fare. And I think uh, the combination of dialogue, uh, groups like that, and again, content creators, producers and writers who, have, who are in touch, you know, and, and I see it happening, uh, they'll create these vehicles that will hopefully reach you know the mass public. And when, so, when are we going to see be able to see your documentary? Uh, our target date is uh, the end of uh, the summer, um, which, which is uh, probably around September ish. It called? It's called Linsanity. It's a, the story of Jeremy Lin. So uh, that's we'll another forward. panel. We're going to have to we're going to have to wrap it up actually. Okay. So this person he was really yeah, nice. She, uh, Maybe just one quick, uh, La one last question. Sure, then. and I have a very general question. Uh, I was wondering, uh, maybe for the future, to discuss the uh, the topic of class along with race, and maybe discuss how different uh, racial groups, what is their relationship with money and money management? Because I, I feel like that's the uh, the divider, and that dictates, you know, what's going to happen with your life. So let me just uh, mention, I think it was a two years ago that Omar Wasau was uh, up on the stage and made a huge point of that very, very point, which was it's not just race, it is class and, and wealth. And uh, uh, I, it, it will come back uh, in this uh, series, I'm sure. Thomas, Brian, and Anna, thank you very much. Thank you, Jose.